It really is a bizarre story, isn't it? Of a raving madman and demons flying into a herd of kamikaze pigs. And, of course, it's become fashionable these days to dismiss a story like that as folklore. And it has been suggested that the story of the healing of the demoniac was embellished to please the Jews uh, so that not only would a, a smile come to their faces at the thought of these pigs rushing headlong uh, into the, uh, into the, the water. Uh, p- pigs, of course, were unclean animals. But it's quite possible that they may have made a connection between the word pig, uh, which was a slang word for a legion anyway, and it's no coincidence that the demon's name was legion, which would simply have been a word borrowed from Latin and used by the Jews to mean a large number or a pun referring to the legion of the Roman occupying armies. So they could well have seen it as a dig against the occupying Romans. However, this is Luke's world where evil spirits are real. And the people of the day genuinely believed that evil spirits could invade people, which is one reason why they were so careful uh, about, eating, uh, about what they ate, because this could happen if you ate the wrong sort of food. That's why they perhaps were, the Jews were so fussy about their diets. But even sleeping with your mouth open. Uh, so be, beware if your partner snores, by the way. You know, and, and we, we still have a, a throwback, don't we? If, if you say, if you sneeze, somebody is bound to say, bless you, because it was believed that when you, you sneezed and you opened your mouth, the a devil could creep in and enter the body. But we'd be making a great mistake if we took the story literally and no further. Uh, it's got its own problems. If you check the geography of the area, for example, um, you find that Garasa, or Garasa, where the event took place, is actually over 30 miles from Lake Gennesaret, which would make them the most energetic pigs in history. <laughs> and you see, if you limit yourself in this way, you and I would fail to see the symbolism behind the story. In other words, a miracle was a sign. And and of course, in John's Gospel, uh, John rarely uses the word miracle. He he always uses the words sign because the, the, the things that Jesus did always point to something else, something deeper. And that's why, I mean, I'm personally always concerned about uh some churches often from overseas who lay so much stress on signs and wonders as if we needed to, to have them at a, a regular dose of them to maintain our faith, as it were. But let's look at the story again. Look at the reaction of the onlookers. Very interesting. You know, they'd seen the miracle. It really was extraordinary. This man uh, was com- completely uncontrollable. He would go berserk. He, he would rip his clothes. He'd even break chains. He, was, he lived in the tombs. He was almost beyond redemption, beyond control. And they saw this incredible change that had taken place. Did they too believe? No. No. Not a bit of it. None of this 
praising God and thank God and who's this man Jesus, a great prophet or a healer, wonderful, let's hear more of him. Oh no, they asked Jesus to go. And if you look at Mark's version, which is in Mark 5, Mark has a slightly longer, uh, considering he's a shorter gospel anyway, he's got, he got a slightly longer version of the story. Mark actually puts it even more bluntly, and Mark writes, not the people asked Jesus to leave them, which is what Luke has, but he says, they began to beg Jesus to leave their neighborhood. Interesting, isn't it, that he, seeing, even seeing such an astonishing miracle at first hand does not bring faith. Miracles do not create faith. It is faith that allows us to see miracles. It's the other way around. It's the other way around. And in this particular episode in Jesus' ministry, the crowd had got stuck on the sign. They failed to see the deeper meaning beyond it. They failed to see beyond it. And it still happens. People get stuck on the sign. Uh, the name Colin Morris will be familiar to uh, those of you who are Methodists. He was the president of conference uh, he spoke a lot on the radio, a uh, very, very gifted speaker. He wrote books and, uh, um, yeah, much loved minister. And I, I have a number of his books, but, but he tells on one occasion how he, he, he once saw a sign outside a shopping mall Dogs must be carried. Dogs must be carried. And he thought to himself, is this a condition of entry? I mean, will, will a plastic one do? You know? <laughs> and he, he spent some time in Nigeria, and uh, he, t he tells of another lovely, <laughs> lovely story where he saw another sign by a road. Uh, it wasn't misspelt, but a comma had been left off. And the sign said, elephants, and it should have had a comma, elephants drive slowly. <laughs> I remember being in, when I, I, I spent a short time in Kenya, and uh, I was warned about elephants, because uh, I had to get up in the middle of the night to do what gentlemen do. And uh, the chap I was staying with, the superintendent, came after me, because the loo was about... 200 yards down into, into the wood, really, and, uh, and he was concerned. He said, oh, people have been attacked by elephants. Be careful. <laughs> elephants drive slowly. And Colin Morris says, well, I'm glad about that. <laughs> Wouldn't want them to drive any... Do you see what I mean? Um, but what happens if we... See, what happens then if we see beyond the sign? I mean, it, it's, it's quite a simple message, and I'm sure I'm not telling you anything you don't know already. In verse 38, we find that as Jesus was preparing to leave this unfriendly and unbelieving people, a man comes up to him and begs him to go with him. And what's Jesus' response? It's to commission him to witness to what God had done for him. And if we're to take Luke's order of things, he's not even commissioned the disciples. He's not sent the dis disciples on their, their, you know, two by two and so on. So why, why is fascinating? Why this change? Because I believe this man, Legion, had experienced the heart of the gospel, the love of God for every individual. So easy to repeat those words, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world, you know. 
It's actually, you know, it slips off the tongue. Try saying it when you get home and replacing the word world with the first person singular. For God so loved me that he gave his only begotten son that if I believe in him, I will not perish but have eternal life. You know, he'd been transformed. His life had been transformed into something new. And Charles Wesley, we could have had one of Charles Wesley's hymns, which has that wonderful uh, verse. My chains fell off, my heart was free. I rose, went forth, and followed thee. And you see, if at times we cling to old memories and old hurts, and if there are things that imprison us, regrets, you know, and as you get older and you look back at your life and you think, oh, I made a right raspberry of that or I, I wish I could have done things differently in another situation. Very easy to have regrets very easy to cling on to old sins, as it were, guilt and hurts that chain us. But we should remember that at the heart of the gospel is the affirmation that you and I can be free, that like legion, we can be transformed, provided that we see beyond the miracle, beyond the sign to the truth of the gospel message. And if you look at chapter 8 in Luke as a whole, you know, uh, you, you've, what, what else do we find? Jairus' daughter, brought back from the dead or near dead. Uh, the woman with the issue of blood, reaching out and touching Jesus' cloak. Again, transformation. You know, and re Luke reminds us that the gospel is not... It's not about assent, you know, it's, we're not asked to have faith about Jesus, that we, we give our assent to certain Christian propositions because they're a pretty good idea, they make logical sense, and though they do, we're asked to have faith in Jesus. We're asked to do more than give our assent to a way of living. Christianity is far more than that. It's about something that happens in each one of us. And you and I, I'm sure, have met people for whom it has made a radical change. Transformation, something that fundamentally happens to us. It doesn't matter whether it's swift or slow, with most of us, it, it usually takes a very, very long time. But we're never the same. And each time we respond, we experience God's Spirit giving us, she gives us the breath of new life. Well, some years ago, I was driving the car in this country, actually, when I saw a road sign uh, which had actually broken. I always remember it. I, it was actually near a cemetery. And uh, the sign, <laughs> it, it obviously had, had been damaged, but the sign said, through road. Not no through road, but through road. Perfect, you see perfect for you and for all our loved ones who've gone before and for Julia who died two days ago. Through road. The man in Luke's story had lived among the tombs, but now he was truly alive. And perhaps this is a reminder to us that even in the grimmest situations, we're given pointers to new life in Christ.